Hi. Um, thanks for inviting me. I'd like to start out academic talks by telling people that I got expelled from Cooper Union School of Architecture in 1989. And so it's always a little bit of a validation to be at Harvard, which is awesome. <laughs> Um, all right, so I'll just dive right in. So um, the project is about field paper. Some of you um, know it, some of you use it. Um, I want to kind of set it in the context of, um, of the work that we do at Stamen and how we think about maps. Um, so we'll talk about uh, field papers in just a sec, but I just want to talk about two projects that we've launched in the last uh, couple of months um, to kind of give us a context for discussion so it's not just a demo. So the first one is, um, and I'll go through these quickly because I know you're here to hear about field papers. Um, the first one is uh, the project we put together with the University of Richmond using Carta DB's great tools um, called Far and Born. Um, it's a, it's a, one of a series of maps that we did that's about, uh, their, it's a historical atlas of the United States. Um, and there's a couple of different, different pieces. There's pieces about slavery, there's pieces about the canals. Um, but this one is about um, the foreign born populations of the United States. So I'll just go through this example. You can do this for every county uh, in the United States, um, and it shows you where the people that lived there during that decade were born. So uh, I did this yesterday as I was getting ready to do this talk. So um, this is for Boston, uh, or the county that Boston is in. And you can see that Ireland is pretty high. Um, this is in 1870. And what I want to do is step forward and go through time and just take a look. I've put a little dot next to Ireland just because it's the one that, that, that people, I think, most strongly associate with, with, um, with, with Boston. So um, we're way at the top, and we've got 34%. If you can't read it, it's okay. It's 34% of the county's uh, population was foreign born. Oh, should I do something? Turn it off. Oh. OK. Hey, that's good, right? OK, great. So 34% of Boston is um, born in the, in, in the, not in the United States in 1870, which is to be expected. Um, and most of those are Irish by far. Um, and as we move forward through time, you start to see that number change a bit. Um, uh, still at the top in 1880, still at the top in uh, 1890, um, still again in 1900, um, again in 1910. So this, but other groups are coming up. Um, and then there's this great, like, this great Canadian surge that happens in the 1930s, where for a brief moment, the Canadians unseat the Irish um, as the kings of, of, of Boston. Um, and then uh, Ireland comes back up again, uh, and then starts to drop in the 50s, um, comes up again in the 60s, there's this kind of jousting, and then the decline starts in the 70s, where um, we start to get 1980, we start to see more from Italy, um, gets more and more until 2010, it drops off the top list entirely. So um, the, it points this picture, it paints this picture of, a, of, a, of an incredibly diverse uh, country over time. Um, and we just start to see, you can start to do things like discover stories inside of, um, inside of this data. You know, we go from a, from a very dominant kind of Irish place to a place that still um, has a large percentage of its uh, uh, population is foreign born, 27%, um, but it's much more ethnically diverse and spread around the world. Um, so the, the story here is that we're a nation of immigrants, we always have been a nation of immigrants, uh, and it doesn't matter what fucking Donald Trump says. Um, that's kind of one um, angle on kind of data visualization and, and mapping, and I want to try and draw a triangle between that and field papers, and, and this other project that we put together just recently called the Atlas of Emotions, a very different kind of map, um, a map of um, how emotions work inside our bodies. Um, and so it's, a, it's less of a kind of cartographic map than kind of a more of a diagrammatic map. So for us, the, the, the boundaries between um, geographic map and non-geographic map are, we think of them both as different kinds of data visualization. It's just that one of them has a geographic component that's obvious, and another one may not have a geographic component. So um, this is a project. Uh, talking about intensities of emotional states um, and about how they, they all sort of fit inside your body. Um, very different kind of thing. We've got different kinds of actions that come out of our emotions, and I'm happy to talk about that. But the fun part about the project, um, in addition to kind of uh, sort of restating what it means to be a map, um, is who the client was. Um, that's me getting design feedback from uh, the Dalai Lama in July. Um, I can tell you that um, having pitched him on a project, I'm not afraid to ask anybody for money. So if you want me to do that for you, let me know. Um, and uh, 
I took that photo. Uh, he's, I just wanted to show you, I mean, any project that I can, any, any uh, talk that I give that I can show a photograph of the Dalai Lama wearing Mickey Mouse ears is a good talk as far as I'm concerned. So, so that's a, it's a different kind of map. So he, so, so, and Paul Ekman is on the left there in, in this photograph, and he, um, he is a psychologist that studied emotion. He's a, you know, it's a scientific uh, process for him. Um, he very famously went to Papua New Guinea in the 60s, took photographs of people's faces as they were talking about different kinds of emotions. And so it's a scientific project um, that he was asked by his friend, the Dalai Lama, to, to take on, which we did with him. So just to, I kind of wanted to get those out there as a, as a way to, to kind of talk about how we think about mapping, that we don't just think about a sort of straight, um, you know, one-to-one -one relationship between what's in the world and what's on the map, but that there we, we have a lot of room for a creative license, and we think about these things in a, in a kind of cultural context, not just in a, let's show the information as cleanly, as clearly as we can. So bringing it back to field papers, um, does anyone here not know what OpenStreetMap is? Okay, so... Um, uh, field Papers it, uh, was designed um, with support uh, by USAID um, to allow people to work with inputting data into OpenStreetMap without um, needing to bring digital equipment into the field. Um, it's designed for use in crisis areas um, where perhaps for um, cultural reasons or maybe it's dangerous or for whatever reason that you don't want to be seen carrying digital stuff and annotating it, um, that's what it's for. Um, and it lets you use paper as the medium to gather your geographic information. So um, I'll just jump right into it. It was funded um, by, by the USAID and done in conjunction with the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. Ah, you are awesome. Thank you. I was wondering how long I was going to last. So what you do is you go to the internet. You go to a map that's on the left-hand side. Um, you print out that map. You take it with you into the field, um, and then you take a picture of it or scan it and use it as a template for entering information into a, a GIS system, in this case OpenStreetMap, but it can be used for, for, for others. And I'll talk more about that at the end. So this is what it looks like. Um, there's a QR code to uniquely identify it, um, and there's, this is a printout of an 8.5 by 11 sheet of paper. We recently changed it to um, uh, more international st uh, styles sizings rather, excuse me. Um, and then this is it. So you basically draw on it um, and use your kind of local knowledge of being in that place. Um, and uh, people do this all around the world. I've got some examples of it. Um, lots of different kinds of annotation. For me, the, the aesthetic qualities of this is super fun. The kind of, I love the nature of the kind of hand stuff on top of the digital stuff. So each one of those atlases also gets a URL. And so once you've done making your annotations, you can then take a photograph of it, you bring it to a place where it's okay for you to be using digital tools. And then it's used as a template to be able to do things like edit OpenStreetMap on top of it. Um, it looks like this when the atlas is done. Um, you've got its location in the world. Um, you've got it, um, you've got the, 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 the atlas and the, and the bounds there, um, and then uh, links to be able to do things like edit it. A um, couple more examples here. Uh, it's, it's just been, it's been interesting to watch the ways in which people use it. I mean, you can basically, anything that you can draw, you can put on this map. Um, you can put dots on, you can put lines on, and then all the different kind of open street map editing tools um, are available to you. And just to start to think about kind of patterns and different ways in which people do that. Um, one thing that we really want to do next is to start to do things like auto-detect features that you've drawn on the map. So if I've used a red pen, it will sort of suggest something different than if I've used a blue pen, and I should be able to determine that myself. Um, they're all over the world. Um, people annotate them in all these different kinds of ways. And then when you bring them into the editing environment, it looks something like this. So, you know, again, it, it sort of, it, it coexists with other editing tools and is primarily a source of kind of personalization um, for, uh, for, um, for editing. It can lead to some dramatic improvements in the quality of uh, different places in the world. Um, it's used a lot of times in humanitarian um, disasters and relief and things like that. So this was OpenStreetMap um, before uh, an editing party that was done using field papers uh, and afterwards. So it can be, it can be quite dramatic. 
OpenStreetMap is like Wikipedia, you know, like it's got, there's some places in the world that are totally obsessively detailed down to the level of all the fire departments or all the fire hydrants in Berlin. And then you've got huge areas in like Bangladesh where there's just nothing, there's just nothing there. So it's kind of like Wikipedia where like it has everything that you would ever want to know about like manga comics, but like maybe nothing about, you know, uh, a president. Um, the website um, lets uh, anybody see who has been making these. You'll also notice that a lot of them, um, some people are um, logged in, but most, by and large, people do this anonymously. Um, so we let people just kind of pass through. Um, there's a bunch of them, almost half a million at this point so far worldwide. Um, this is a map where every square, very light on that, uh, on that map, um, is a square, uh, is an atlas, rather. Um, I was surprised how often it was used in Europe. You know, the whole point, you can see the big dense cluster in Europe and then a couple little places around the world. We're not sure why that is. Um, people, I guess, you know, it, it was intended to be used um, in crisis situations. And there are some crisis situations um, in, in Europe, but not nearly as uh, many uh, as would be suggested by this map. So I think it's just that people like using paper. And that's one of those kind of like, you put things out into the world and they, um, uh, you, you discover uh, that your use case might be very different. So you always have to be in the process of listening to your, to your users and revising. So um, we can take a look at how often it's used in Africa. Um, that big bar down at the bottom is in Kenya, um, but also a, a bit in North Africa um, and in the um, Azores. Really dense cluster. I don't know where this is. Maybe somebody can tell me if that's in uh, South Africa. Okay. Victoria, thank you. Uh, there's Kenya, emphasis on Nairobi. Uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone. Uh, there was a big uptick um, after the earthquake in Nepal, Kathmandu. Just sort of interesting that there's this kind of, <laughs> that, I mean, when, every time we, if we regenerate this map, there's a new crisis zone that's appeared on it. So we're sort of incidentally and accidentally generating maps of, um, of crisis response around the world. So I want to talk about how this gets used a bit. Um, we put this out there and, and, and uh, essentially made it available for, for people to use. But a lot of times, um, we're finding that um, the people who are using our, uh, the, the project look like this, um, sort of stereotypically not typical computer users, right? Um, local people. Um, it's almost always done in groups. It's very rare that someone will go out on their own and, 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 uh, and do this. And it's part of it is the kind of um, the mapping party nature of it. Um, it's starting to be used in some of the refugee camps. Um, we were talking earlier about um, uh, uh, Sudan and the, um, the, 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 the refugee crisis that happened there, where people were trying to come back to their villages um, after having been away for 10 years, this conversation that we were having earlier, um, in order to get a census uh, so that they, they could um, you know, sort of participate in the country's democracy. But uh, the, the villages were nomadic already before the, before the census. So just this kind of like immediately, you know, just, just totally impossible problem of how to deal with, with, how to do a mapping of places that move, right? Um, same kind of thing with refugee camps, like sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not. And it's easy for us to sort of in this age of, you know, Google Maps and everything feel like the maps that we see are just kind of like stamped down by the hand of God and they're kind of like these perfect one-to-one -one representations of what's happening in the world. But um, doing this kind of work, you realize that that's very much not the case. Um, sometimes they're used in conjunction with digital tools, um, so it's not necessarily about um, you know, it being dangerous, but maybe there's only one phone in the village. Um, and so um, uh, they're, they're used in this kind of way too. Um, here's another kind of group scenario that people have been uh, using them in. And this one, I, I love this quote, the first, cart the first cartography of Lubumbashi since the, Belgian, since the Belgians left. So these kind of ideas of, of groups of people um, putting themselves on the map, again, literally. I just love looking at these pictures. You know, there's just like people out there sort of taking control of their lives, putting themselves on the map. It's, it's fun. So there's building it, um, which we did about nine years ago. And then there's tending to it. Um, and this is a, a kind of big issue for any of these open source mapping projects. And, and those of you who are involved in them know, know it really well. It's just it's hard to make the time to do it if you're not getting paid. Um, and so this has been one of the, you know, we did this and we got paid to do it and that was really good, but there's, there's no budget for maintenance 
of it. So we have to make decisions according to that. Um, there should be a budget for maintenance. These things are, these things are important, but, um, but a lot of times funders want to fund the building of something, but they don't necessarily want to fund the maintenance of it. So as a commercial design studio, we've got to make some decisions about how to do that. So I want to talk about those. Um, when you do a technical project, um, the technology changes as, um, as, as time moves forward. So um, a lot of times you can find yourself in very different technical constraints at the, end of a, at, the, at the end of a project than you've done at the beginning of one. So the first thing was simplify, just to sort of break it down, um, reduce the dependencies. Second was to take advantage of newer technology. And then the third was to broaden its reach internationally. And so and in the United States, I often forget that most people don't use 8.5 by 11 paper. <laughs> we just didn't know that. And for a thing that's supposed to be in crisis uh, scenarios, um, uh, that, that, seemed, that became important. Um, we decided to cut things out of it that even though some people were asking for them that were going to be too difficult because we couldn't figure it out, um, how to do it effectively so it doesn't support MB tiles, sorry. Um, there's no notation capabilities, we haven't done that yet, um, and there's no export of any kind. It's not a full-on GIS stack, it's a, got a very specific use case. So you have to decide what you're going to put in and also more importantly what you're going to take out. So this is the bane of my uh, existence. Um, I get an email to info at um, that says I'm unable to create new atlases. And they get stuck. And the reason we finally di diagnosed why this was happening is that the OpenStreetMap tiles were timing out and the system would just kind of fall over. But, but having to diagnose this kind of stuff um, takes time. And time is money, and, and, and we don't have it. Um, same kind of thing here. There's no <laughs> sort of like uh, we're hiding in obscurity. There's no contact details on the site, but you are down as the builders. Um, so people find us um, and, and reach out to us. We need to fix this. We want to fix this. One of the things that we've been doing um, has been being much more public about the project on these kind of open software platforms with social media. Um, so uh, rather than kind of going to an email through us, you submit a ticket to, um, to the GitHub repository for field papers. And that's just a very different situation than was, um, was, was existing when we first built the project. So it looks like this. There's lots of different repos. Um, and people file issues here. So we're trying to, instead of having to kind of hide from email requests, to try and be more actively engaged in the community and say, well, you've noticed that it's broken. That's great. Please file an issue, and then maybe someone will pick it up. Right. So that's, that's kind of this, uh, the kind of slow burn of, of movement uh, on, on the project's maintenance. Um, we've also started reaching out to the community to help us with translation. Um, there's a really neat project called TransEffects that will let you collaboratively and with others identify specific pieces of your code base that need to be translated. Um, and then someone else will translate them, and then somebody else has to verify that that translation is correct in order for it to go into the repo. So this, this kind of stuff is really changing, too, and it's, it's getting really good. Um, and it's allowed, to less, it's allowed us to translate the project, I think, into 15 languages so far. You know, not actually having anybody who's a native speaker of any of those languages um, in, uh, in, our, in our shop. We can just reach out to the community to do it. It's been really good. So um, what happens next? Um, the new piece of the project um, has been sponsored by the American Red Cross. Um, and it's about um, really uh, putting our money where our mouth is about putting the world's vulnerable people uh, on the map. Um, and it's called Portable Open Street Map. Um, and it's a little technical, but it's fun to think about. Basically, the, the way that field papers works is you have your piece of paper, and then you are out in the field, and then you take it back to where there's internet, and then you do your annotations. Well, it turns out that there's a good number of places in the world where there just isn't enough internet to support this kind of thing. But you still want to be able to do this work. So what the Red Cross has been funding um, has been uh, a, uh, the, the, the creation of a, a set of software and hardware protocols that allow um, people to take an extract of OpenStreetMap from a place where there is internet access, take that with them into the field, and it just happens on a thumb drive or whatever. Then you've got a kind of localized copy of this. And, opens, and um, Field Papers is running on a kind of local server. And that doesn't have to be connected to the internet at all. So all the changes can take place in this kind of very local environment. And then um, when you bring that flash drive back to the place where there's internet, the syncing happens more or less automatically. Um, and you know you need hardware like this, um, this kind of stuff, a little solid straight drive, a little chip to run it. Um, and so basically, for under 300 bucks, you've got the ability to take OpenStreetMap into the field, edit it, do your do your um, do your editing there, uh, and then bring it back to a place where it's safe to do that. 
So um, it's been super fun working with the Red Cross. Um, we're looking for more partners and funding, and we're um, looking forward to doing more work. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a project that we feel really passionately about. The Red Cross says that it's too important to fail, um, and um, it's just a fun thing for us to be working on. So I'm, I'm happy to demo it if anybody would be super interested in that, but I hate demos. So thank you for your attention. I don't know how I'm doing on time, so someone will let me know, I guess. So yeah, you have, a, you have plenty of time, uh, 15 minutes, if you would like to do a demo. Um, OK. Maybe we can ask, if anyone has some immediate questions, we can get those while they're fresh. I saw Edward Tufte give a talk one time, and he said the, two, the three rules for talking in public are, one, get some breath mints. Two, start early, something good will happen. And three, finish early, something good will happen. So I'm looking forward to seeing something good happen. <laughs> I don't have breath mints, but no one's around me, so. No, um, me. That's that. I, yeah. OK. <laughs> Far away. Um, so the map that you showed, I wasn't sure if it was the density of users for field papers, but you said that there was there, there are a lot of users um, in Europe currently. Yep. So I'm wondering if you've thought about possibly privatizing um, the field papers for European use, users to subsidize um, field papers in other areas. Oh, that's a great idea. <laughs> no, I haven't thought about it, but yeah. now no I will. Charge. <laughs> What's that? Great thing come out of it. Yeah, no, we're done. Thanks. Yeah, bye. Bye. Um, when people uh, scan back their hand drawings um, and the barcode, probably geo reference the scan back into the, the geographic domain. Right. Um, so their drawings are your software extract their drawings and synchronize it. Those I'll show you. What's what's the yep. synchronization yeah. process? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. No. Sure. Sorry. Um, so this is what it looks like. I'm not going to demo the whole thing because I don't want to print out and all that stuff. But um, I found one um, that was pretty nice. So this is a map um, of a place that I don't know how to pronounce, but it's in Sri Lanka. It was made this morning, um, and it's someone has uh, someone an, an anonymous person unidentified has drawn. You can see these are the the, the buildings that they've drawn um, on the map. And if I go down here and edit, so there's a number of different tools that you use to actually do the importing into OpenStreetMap, and this one um, happens inside of the it's ID, which is the default OpenStreetMap editor. And so now I'm in here, um, and, I've, and you'll notice that. There's, so these are all, the, these are all the, the buildings that already exist in this place. And this is the building that this person has indicated that they want to add into OpenStreetMap. And so what you do is, using their tools, you know, there's a line, an area. And I'm not going to do it because I don't want it's, to. It's, it's their spot. You have, to, you have to trace it. Yeah. So but you know, how awesome would it be if you know, there was an auto? I mean, this is, this is part of what I'm starting to talk about really wanting to do is like, what if I um, what I want is a little area in the lower right-hand corner of the map that's got a little box. And I can put something in there, like a sticker or make a star or something like that. And then, what our, and then you basically put those all over the map where you want. And then this is, you, we train the system to look for those. And that's like a fire hydrant or you know, whatever it is, like that, that type of stuff. You should be able to kind of define yourself what you want to have be auto-extracted. And I think we could do it well enough that it, you know, it wouldn't automatically add it to OpenStreetMap. It would just sort of we could develop a system that would yeah yeah that you can then that you can then work with but so then it, so it's 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 this and then you can see um see it's inside of um it's inside of the some of the other features that are already inside of OpenStreetMap. so and they show up at different at different zoom levels um so yeah so there there it is sort of inside and now i now i can access all the other uh, editing environments and stuff Right. Right. Before they go off. Right. Then if they stick to what they train the system to recognize, then they can come back. Yeah. I, I think we could. I think we could do a. If there's so there's the there's the auto extraction which I totally want to do. 
um, there's uh, leveraging the community, which I totally want to do. Like, we just don't have any concept of like you're a repeat or power user, and so we might treat you differently, or that you might, you know, there's there's like that that whole line of, of thinking that you're that you're opening up is something that we haven't even started. But I, I think also, you know, when it, when we built it, it was more. Uh, of an experiment, and it's kind of it's one of those things where it's become something real, and so now we're just like, okay, so now what are we going to do? So it's the pilot that kept going. Yep. So one of the things expanding on that, it seems like it would be useful when you print out the map, print out a legend. Is somebody writing this down? Can put their <laughs> I can't. symbols in. So if you have the the feature types yep. uh, for OpenStreetMap or the ones that are included. Just print that out, then people can draw in. Right. This this is how I'm showing paths. This is how I'm. <clears throat> I, th I think that's I think that's exactly right. I mean, you should. Uh, this is this is the next piece that I really want to build in, and we'll have to prioritize it. But I want to build a uh, an, an annotation system that 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 you, the user, are in control of. So you have room for up to I don't know what it is, four or five or something, and then you can put because you can you know you can auto detect like I mean if we can if we can auto detect uh, and extract information from from this thing. We should also be able to do it from like a smiley face. You know, if I was to get like a red sticker or a blue sticker or a green sticker, and that and it, that was where the watering holes or whatever are, and I, I so I just put the I put the red sticker on there and I say watering hole, and then the software detects it, right? So no, I think it's I think you're exactly right. Um, actually, just to build off that, um, coming from the other side, like um, maybe sort of I don't know if you've looked into this, but you know, the remote sensing community uses like object-based analysis is you know kind of big deal. Right. Um, and I, I'm sure that it could probably pull out. I mean, and that would kind of give you a little bit more flexibility if someone didn't want, like if they didn't want to have that structured yeah. annotation, be kind of coming at it from the other side. I mean, that, that whole automated sensing thing, I mean, you know, the satellite, the example that, that I always hear is the satellite companies are able to give you a pretty reliable indication of how the economy is going to do based on the number of cars in parking lots in malls and stuff, right? So, like, clearly this stuff exists, right? It's like it's just a question of turning it towards humanitarian purposes. Any other questions? All right. Well, cool. thanks a lot. Thank that you. That was great. Cheers. Well, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us for the whole day. Um,